Now on KGW News, a graduation that almost didn't happen. They said if it was like a couple minutes later, I would have had brain damage or I would have died. How heroes saved this teen's life just in time. Plus, it's a really monumental night for sure. A commission decides on a plan to overhaul Portland's government. The changes you'll get to vote on. And all eyes on our swollen rivers when those water levels should start to go back down. Your news starts now. And we begin tonight with a developing story on the Oregon coast. A building that houses part of the Bowie Beer Company in Astoria has collapsed. You can see from this drone video, part of the roof came down right in the center of the structure that sits along the Columbia River. And we just got an update from the fire chief and city manager who say the most important thing tonight, no one was hurt. And as devastating as it is to the community and our local business owners, um, it really could have been worse if a fire had started or if people would you know, been in the building if it was occupied. The building houses brewing operations and a restaurant, but the restaurant was closed today, so no one was inside. Bowie Beer posted online that everyone is safe, but they did not elaborate on how much this will impact operations. Incredible video there. Inspectors will now try to figure out why that section of roof collapsed and if any part of the remaining building can be saved. The area around it is now blocked off for safety reasons. That includes the stretch of the river trail and the trolley line that run right in front. We're just glad everyone is OK. Absolutely. And tonight we're also on flood watch for the Columbia and other rivers and creeks. This comes after recent storms closed many local parks and trails because of the high water. Since April, we have seen 52 days of measurable amounts of rain. And since March, we've had more than 15 inches of rain. Wow, let's bring in Chief Meteorologist Matt Safino. Matt, we are all feeling waterlogged yeah, to are. say the least. I mean, when can we expect the Columbia to peak here? Yeah, trust me, I'm hearing it from everybody in person, social media. It's like, when's the rain gonna stop? Okay, we still have that flood warning for the lower Columbia River from roughly Camas downstream up past Vancouver to the east side of Savi Island there. That happens until 823 on Thursday night. You may be wondering why 823. Well, it's because of the tides influencing the water level here. We're just barely above flood stage on the Columbia. It's at flood stage is 16 feet. It's at 16.07 feet. So that means it's less than an inch above flood stage. But still, anytime you're close to flood stage, that means there's a lot of extra water moving down the river. The river is running very high. The currents are faster than normal as well. It drops below flood stage, as I said, Thursday, Thursday evening. And then the trend will be for it to continue to decline after that. Now we've got more rain in the forecast, but nothing like what we've been dealing with over the last week, too. Uh, the Willamette also running high and running very, very dark with all the mud and debris in the river, as you can see here from our time lapse earlier in the day. So we've got a warmer day on the way Wednesday. That's the good news. We transition again on Thursday. That's the not so great news. And over the weekend, another wet one. I'll just let the graphic speak for itself. More on that later, guys. All right, we'll take what we can get. Thanks, Matt. Well, tonight it is official. Portland voters will decide this November whether to change how the city governs itself. Let's bring in Alma McCarty following this tonight. Alma, even the mayor has bluntly admitted our current system here just does not work. And David, it was an independent commission that was charged with charting a new and potentially better path forward in a city where commissioners run what are called bureaus and try to make day to day decisions that often step on each other's toes. The final decision on the fine print now up to the voters. After 18 months of work and lots of community outreach, we spent a lot of time looking at what Portlanders are unhappy about and trying to fix that. Tuesday evening, finally a vote. That, my friends, is a super majority. The 20 person charter commission reached a super majority, 17 to 3, leaving a decision that would eliminate Portland's style of government, the last of its kind in any major American city in the hands of its voters. This isn't just fixing around the edges. This is a big, a big change. Melanie billings Yan is the commission's co-chair. First of all, our system is absolutely antiquated. It was made for a different time. We want a city that is more responsive, equitable, representative, um, able to get things done. The commission approved three key changes if the plan 
is implemented. Number one, voters will use what's called ranked choice voting, where they rank candidates in order of their preference. Two, the city will be divided into four new geographic districts. Each district will have three city councilors for a total of 12. And three, those councilors will focus on setting policy while the elected mayor and an appointed professional city administrator run day-to-day -day operations. This is not going to fix everything in January 1 of 2025 that the city faces today, but it has the pathway to remove the silo effects. It has the pathway to have accountability up to the city manager and the mayor. Commission member Andrew Spear also voted in favor and says the plan could help people better connect with those they elect. You have either one or three or two representatives within your district that you can connect with, uh, address issues with, and be engaged. Uh, so that role of council being important of engagement. The three charter commissioners who voted against the reforms package tonight said they need more time to consider and that the three proposed changes to the form of government were together unproven and what they called an experiment. If voters do approve this in November, changes won't go into effect until January 2025. Laurel? I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about this as we get closer to the election. Thank you, Alma. Now let's get you caught up on tonight's other headlines. Deputies in North Clark County say a man shot and killed his roommate in their home. This happened about 7 o'clock last night on Northeast Kelly Road. The Clark County Sheriff's Office said the suspect called deputies to say he'd shot the victim after they both brought out guns during a fight. The suspect cooperated with deputies and was detained. We're working to find out if he will face any charges. And speaking of Clark County Sheriff's staffing levels there have gone from bad to worse with 11 new hires, but they've lost 20 deputies. You may remember about three months ago, the Sheriff's Office was forced to cut back on some of the types of calls deputies responded to. Those included thefts and trespass. The Sheriff says they currently have 70 openings. He's now looking for public support on a proposed tax increase that will be on the ballot in August. He's hoping some of those funds will go toward helping them retain and attract new officers. There is a nationwide blood shortage and agencies from across the region are asking for your help. The Red Cross is looking for blood donors from all races and ethnicities. The organization says this is important because diverse blood donors can help people with different illnesses or inherited diseases. If you would like to donate, the Red Cross is hosting a drive this Saturday in Portland Portland. To sign up, visit redcrossblood.org. Portland's rich history is part of what makes it special. So this next story is particularly upsetting. The owner of a historic building in the Foster Powell neighborhood says a burglar broke in and ransacked the place. This happened at the old Phoenix Pharmacy building at the corner of Southeast 67th and Foster. Police say between one and five Monday morning, somebody broke in through a window, then busted holes in the drywall before moving from business to business. They continued to damage the newly re refurbished building and ran off with some cash. It's it's very challenging and it's just like it's like a gut punch and it's just a total just wake up call as well too. It's like you know you can't just hope things are going to be better. You definitely do have to secure stuff and hunk, hunker down. They believe the person behind the break-in stole a U-Haul and used it to climb onto the roof of the building to get inside. Anyone with information about the case is urged to call police. Well, you might have heard the warning, one pill can kill. It refers to pills that are designed to look like prescription painkillers, but instead have fatal consequences. Now, earlier this year, two students at the same Northeast Portland High School died within 24 hours of each other. One of those, a 16-year-old sophomore and rising tennis star named Griffin Hoffman. Now, on Wednesday, we will bring you Griffin's story. Tonight, here's a preview. His dad threw open the, my bedroom door and said, Carrie, get up, something's wrong with, with Griffin. The first thing I saw was his hand, because his dad was holding it, trying to find a pulse, and there was no pulse, and it was just blue. Did you already have a sense about what might have happened? I figured in the beginning that he took something. He must have taken something and not known. And right away, they found those blue pills. Pills like these that Carrie would later find out looked like oxycodone, but were counterfeit, made with something a hundred times stronger than morphine, fentanyl. 
my kid wasn't an addict, you know? He was just doing normal experimentation like any other kid. He was just like a regular teenager. The fact that it happened to my kid is evidence that it could happen to anybody's kid in a lot of ways. One mother's grief there, and Carrie Cohen is sharing her family story because Griffin is not the only one. At least 11 teenagers and children fatally overdosed on fentanyl in Oregon last year alone. Tomorrow you're going to hear from the top prosecutor who is building a case against the drug trafficker they say is directly responsible for Griffin's death and will take you inside the Portland Police Narcotics Vault to show you the flood of fentanyl and a warning from investigators and what to look out for. We'll have that for you tomorrow night at 11 only here on KGW News.